I'm Dr. Kishishian, and welcome to our podcast series, PPE, Podcast for Psychoeducation, during the COVID-19 pandemic. Today, we're discussing how the pandemic has affected individuals who are struggling with dependence to tobacco, alcohol, or drugs. I'm joined by Dr. Brian Hurley, a specialist in addiction psychiatry and the director of addiction medicine in the LA County Department of Health Services. Hi, Dr. Hurley. Hello. Thanks for having me on the podcast. Thanks for coming. We're going to be focusing on common reasons individuals use alcohol, tobacco, and other drugs, the difficulties that they might be facing to making changes in their use and their reliance on substances, especially given the challenges of the current environment, and what type of resources are available at home and how to access this help. Well, many psychiatrists are not supposed to say what is probably obvious, which is the use of tobacco, alcohol, and other drugs starts off as fun. People start using drugs because it's fun to use. Mm -hmm. And that fun sometimes comes from, you know, an escape, right? Uh, Drugs and alcohol help uh, people feel something different than what they're feeling already, so it helps them cope. Some people use drugs and alcohol out of boredom, right? So this uh, helps them feel something where ordinarily uh, their emotions might be muted in their day-to-day lives. Um, But people usually start using substances because they're fun. And what happens is the more you use a substance, the more it gets woven into your day-to-day life, the more dependent or reliant you become on it to function normally. And so uh, one thing that you'll sometimes hear in addiction treatment circles is this phrase, I got sick and tired of being sick and tired, is, you know, drugs and alcohol stopped being fun, and now I'm just using so that I don't feel badly. I'm using to keep from feeling withdrawal. I'm not using because it's fun anymore. But if you don't use, you get sick, and most people want an escape, you know, want to be able to exit that cycle of intoxication and withdrawal. That makes sense. Um, How do you think the pandemic has changed or intensified these reasons or reactions or outcomes? So the pandemic has turned most everything in mental health and, 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 and in addiction way up. So if people were somewhat reliant on using alcohol and somewhat over drinking prior to the pandemic, we're now seeing people drinking much heavier. Uh, uh, you know, if somebody was using um, or smoking infrequently, you know, I, I have some of my own patients that prior to the pandemic were really working on smoking cessation. They were really working on cutting down. And, you know, I had several of them contact me like, yep, nope, smoking right, you know, right back to where I was before I started. In fact, it's even worse now. So we are seeing that the pandemic is really turning up people's substance use. So this reliance on substances is obviously very difficult and it affects many aspects of your life, not only physically and emotionally, financially, your social well-being, you know, your relationships. Why do you think it's so hard to make changes without some sort of help? Well, when people start using substances, again, I talked about it being woven into kind of the fabric of somebody's day-to-day life. I'll use cigarettes as an example. You know, it's pretty easy to say, well, just stop smoking. But if you actually think about what does that mean for somebody, it means that they have to wake up. And if you are a regular smoker, you wake up in nicotine withdrawal. That's, that's physiologic. You know, that's the half-life of nicotine is short. So, um, so it pretty much everyone wakes up craving cigarettes. So you have to learn how to wake up and not smoke and drink coffee and not smoke and get to work and not smoke and go on a break and not smoke to socialize with people, not smoke, and be able to tolerate good things happening and not celebrating with a cigarette or tolerate stress and not smoke. So it really requires you to relearn so many elements of your lives that are usually paired with smoking. So that's one of the reasons it's so difficult is um, people sort of have to unlearn this behavior. And that's not even counting the physical tolerance, right? Like people who smoke cigarettes wake up in physical nicotine withdrawal that's relieved by smoking. So there's this physiologic tolerance and withdrawal that develop with tobacco, alcohol, and opioid use disorders, as well as sedatives and other types of, uh, of drugs that um, make it challenging for people to just stop. And so the combination of needing to unlearn a lot of behaviors, needing to learn a new set of healthy coping mechanisms and getting support, and being able to uh, get through the physiologic withdrawal that comes from stopping use are all things that stack up against people. Um, And a lot of people do need assistance in being able to change their substance use on their own. And so, I mean, it's right. A lot of different things. It's become kind of woven into your life, like you said, and the pandemic I'm sure has changed that because our lives have changed in so many different ways as well. Um, What can we do during this time to help ourselves if we're struggling with this? 
The one thing that I remind people is we're in an area of physical distancing, but not social distancing. So I think the term social distancing is, is actually misnamed. Uh, plenty of us are socially connected. We're, for example, connected here through a you know, telehealth platform or technology platform. And so um, I, you know, I would say uh, there's all kinds of ways of getting counseling and support now, but they're different the people that need to do the connecting are not always familiar with the, you know, uh, uh, technology platforms and the people doing the providing are also learning how to deliver care virtually. Absolutely. And do you have any um, good websites or resources that you might recommend as a good place where somebody can start to learn? So, um, you know, I'm an addiction physician. So there's the American Society of Addiction Medicine has a whole coronavirus webpage, um, a portion of which is dedicated to patients and families. So I would, uh, uh, that would be my, the first thing I would offer. Uh, the Department of Mental Health access, the LA County Department of Mental Health has an access telephone number that uh, anybody can access. It's 24 hours a day that is now um, oriented to how to provide care virtually during the public health emergency. So uh, there's an entire now algorithm within the access center around helping support uh, communities in Los Angeles um, get through. And then the Department of Health Services Patient Access Center is another resource to connect people to services that are available remotely, I think are going to be uh, worthwhile sources of support for patients that are looking for assistance during the public health emergency. And do you find that in your experience, a lot of times, sometimes it's the patient that realizes that they need help, and then sometimes it's the family member that's trying to find resources. Do you have any specific um, suggestions for family members? Well, as a general bit of advice, um, uh, the person with the substance use disorder is the person ultimately that has to participate in treatment, but it's rare for somebody with a substance use disorder to sort of spontaneously decide to go to treatment. It's oftentimes families that are ushering them into that readiness. And in terms of readiness um, for that, uh, uh, Al-Anon, uh, and particularly Al-Anon is for the um, uh, family members of people with alcohol use disorder, and there's a framework for how to support people using the 12 steps um, uh, of treating alcohol use disorder. Um, NAMI is actually a really wonderful resource, certainly for mental health, but also um, the uh, National Alliance for Mental Illness, or for the mentally ill, is a really helpful organization that has a whole around, uh, um, array of guidance that is helpful for both mental health and substance use disorders. Um, uh, SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse Mental Health Services Administration, has a number of resources for, for uh, family members. And then locally, um, the Department of Mental Health regularly receives calls from family members that can provide guidance on the resources that are available. There's actually a 24-hour Substance Abuse Services Helpline um, that uh, is oriented to patients. It's not oriented to family members, but the family members could call to help um, get information to connect patients to for when the patient is actually ready to make some changes. So it sounds like even though COVID has changed a lot of things, and especially how we provide health care, um, there are a lot of resources still out there, and we have figured out creative ways through technology to help reach people even during this time. That's right. And more importantly, it seems like the stress that COVID has brought has potentially worsened um, people's need for her, their reliance on these substances. And so this might be a golden opportunity to get the help that you need. It can be. And I'd remind people that the treatments for addictions are medications, counseling, and support. And so you can get medications even without an in-person visit. Um, you can get counseling telephonically and through telehealth. And there's all kinds of ways of supporting. Many of my patients are now going to um, uh, smart recovery meetings or 12-step meetings or, you know, uh, there's all kinds of mutual self-help group meetings that are happening virtually. So there are ways of getting each component of affection, of effective addiction treatment virtually. Um, it's just the coronavirus public health emergency has shifted the way that we deliver um, th those domains of treatment to people. And thank you for making that. So it's very important to discuss this with your doctors, your healthcare providers, so that they can help guide you during this process. You should absolutely be talking to your doctors, and doctors I mean very broadly, to your primary care doctor, to your psychiatrist or psychiatric nurse practitioner. If you end up in the emergency room, to the emergency physician, or if you end up in the hospital, to the hospital physician. That is, addiction can be treated in any setting of care. Thank you. There are a lot of options. Talk to your doctor. Talk to your healthcare providers. Get informed. There are resources out there, and we will get creative with the technology that we have. That's exactly right. 
Thank you, Dr. Hurley. I really appreciate you taking the time. Thanks for having me.